Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Akiba Etzo um, from Eisner Hydrogen Storage Materials Division. Uh, today, I'd like to uh, be a uh, chair of this uh, seminar. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Tom Ochre from uh, PNL. PNL means uh, Pacific Northwestern National Laboratory. It's uh, one of the DOE Institute. Uh, it's located in the West, state of Washington, not Washington, D.C. Uh, I would say nearby Seattle. <laughs> and uh, I just introduced him uh, briefly. Um, Dr. Tom Otre is a staff, staff scientist in the fundamental and the computational science uh, director at the uh, uh, director, directorate at the PNL. Um, he his current research interests are focused on materials and uh, approaches to hydrogen storage for small power and onboard fuel cell applications. And uh, in U.S., uh, there are two major uh, funding sources, especially for hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, they are uh, a basic uh, research office and uh, E E E R E. Uh, energy Efficiency and uh, Renewable Energy uh, Division of uh, DOE, uh, Department of Energy in U.S. So he receives uh, funding both uh, agents. One is uh, uh, fundamental on hydrogen storage materials. The other one is uh, to develop uh, most advanced uh, hydrogen storage materials. It's a uh, uh, type of uh, liquid hydrogen storage material. And also, he uh, plays an important role of a scientific society in the U.S. Uh, one is uh, he serves on the Luhan Center Neutron Review Committee at uh, LANS. It's uh, one of the uh, most famous neutron sources uh, in the U.S. And also, he uh, uh, plays an advisory, advisory board for the hydrocarbon resources, Gordon Research Conferences, and also he's a uh, Panel expert on the International Energy Agency, IEA, task on hydrogen storage. And uh, I founded yesterday, uh, in 1987, uh, Tom and PhD degree in chemistry from uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where our director, Professor Sofronis, works, and uh, our satellite is located. Okay, Tom, please. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. It's a, a real pleasure to, to, to be here and visit uh, Professor Akiba-san, who has invited me, and we've talked for a number of years, and so I had an opportunity to, um, uh, after attending a workshop uh, in uh, Jeju Island last week on hydrogen storage, to come by here before going home to uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. <clears throat> um, what uh, I'm going to tell you about is, is sort of um, we're in a transition period right now in, in research in the U.S. funding and also uh, in, in our research group. And I'll, I'll kind of give you a little overview of where we were at and, and how it's changed um, in, in uh, doing the chemical research approach to these things and, and, and a little bit of touch on where we're going with, these, uh, with, um, with this insight and this knowledge that we gained about using chemical hydrides for, for hydrogen storage. This, this is um, uh, a, a road actually um, uh, to uh, to Seattle from our laboratory, and so we, we, li we live on the other side of the Cascade Mountain Range, and uh, it's about a 300-mile um, or 200-mile uh, uh, driving range to get to uh, Seattle from our laboratory. We're on the eastern part of uh, uh, Washington State, and much longer to drive to Champaign-Urbana. It's a, it's a longer drive. And in Champaign-Urbana, this would all, they'd all be corn fields. I guess if you've been the, the, there, you'd, you'd, you'd see that. Um, let me see if I can I'll do, th do this manually. Um, so, what I, so sort of a motivation um, for, for us is, is we've been interested in, in hydrogen storage at low pressures. And I have seen a, a fascinating tour um, about the high pressure uh, capabilities here. And it was really uh, f fantastic, the equipment. Uh, what we've been working on is, is low pressure uh, approaches to hydrogen storage. So these, these are much longer term, uh, down the road sorts of things. In the near term, it's really going to require uh, high pressure tanks and, and the sort of research that's going on in here in the, the materials. 
Uh, what we are doing research on is, is uh, for looking at hydrogen storage and chemical bonds. And, uh, and so it's, it, we have two sort of uh, um, driving motivations for, for our research. Um, fuel cell um, and, and storing it in protonic and hydritic hydrogen bonds. And so I'll get into more detail of what I mean by this. And, and sort of what we've done, used to get there is, is from a chemical point of view, is what as chemists we like to describe as, as Lewis acids and Lewis bases. And I think that will become apparent as I, I show you what's going on. And so what we're interested in now is not only hydrogen storage um, in, for materials, but also other applications for these materials um, that go beyond hydrogen storage. And, and the approach that we've taken as chemists has been really to, to do mechanistic studies. And so I'll, I'll give you some sort of the, the uh, approach through a chemist's eyes of how, how we would approach to to optimize these materials. And so there's, there's these reports that the hydrogen comes from these materials, but how does it come from these materials? And so we've worked on trying to understand uh, how the hydrogen comes off from mechanistic studies. Um, I'll give you some sort of three sort of areas, separate areas, uh, little parts of where we worked at, um, where we looked at solid phase chemistry of ammonium borohydride, this ABH2, and, and I'll, sh I'll have the structure later on, but this is 24 weight percent hydrogen. And my new favorite compound uh, that we just sort of finished up uh, on this project was an ethylene diamine um, um, bisporane complex. And, and so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of overview. That's the, kind of the most recent results from, from our group. And, and now we're transitioning into doing solution phase liquid hydrogen carriers. Uh, one of the real challenges if, if you, for chemical hydrogen storage, if you're using solids, how do you get a solid off a car and on a car? It's very, very difficult. So can you do this in a solution phase so that you can pump a liquid carrier into a tank and pump the liquid carrier off the tank? So you have like a, a gasoline that's recyclable. And, and then what I'll just kind of briefly touch on on the end is sort of this new direction we're going of trying to take what we've learned from hydrogen storage into developing new areas in catalysis for, for energy storage and, and other materials such as a methanol, taking CO2 to methanol or, or biomass. Uh, that's kind of the popular uh, research area in, in the U.S. And, and around the world. And so we're, we uh, give you an idea of what we're doing, what we've learned, and how we're going to extend that in the future to other areas. And sort of the, kind of the, the gist of the talk is what I want to try and lead you through is how we, we start to, on, on one level and kind of move along and then get a, a, a big step up in, in understanding and move along and get another big step up. So the research doesn't go linearly necessarily. You work for a long time, and then you kind of get these step jumps. And so what I'll do is I'll tell you about these step jumps instead of the, the whole journey through, through there. So we got started in this area. My background is, is chemistry. Uh, when I first started uh, after graduating from University of Illinois, uh, I started in a coal chemistry research group. And so we were interested in how to convert coal to liquids. And so through the, the 90s, coal was... Um, sort of a, an area that D a DOE was interested in and then sort of lost interest. And, and in the early 2000s, uh, there was interest in the hydrogen economy. And so um, a D DOE, the Basic Energy Sciences, commissioned this report on basic research needs for hydrogen storage. And, and they, 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 they talk about four technical challenges. There was, you know, being able to produce hydrogen, and this had to be from renewable resources, one of the real... Um, difficulties with uh, the politics behind hydrogen is that a lot of people will say that to, to use hydrogen you actually burn more carbon than you do if you just burn gasoline because the hydrogen we're using is coming from coal or natural gas and so we have to move beyond that uh, to doing electrolysis and renewable um, sources of hydrogen. Uh, and then hydrogen util utilization and using fuel cells and one of the big challenges discussed there was how do you replace the platinum or palladium and fuel cells, these noble metals with cheap metals, can you do the same sort of thing with cheap metals? Because if everybody's going to have a fuel cell, you need it's, to bring down the cost, you're going to need to come up with uh, cheaper metals. Uh, and then a big question is sort of in the background is, is transport. If, if you're going to have a hydrogen economy for vehicles, how, how are you going to do this? Is this going to be high pressure gases? Is it going to be liquid gases? Or is it going to be solids like some of the materials we've developed? And so all of these things have to come together. And um, one of the things in 2003 that was 
they you know, was sort of suggested to be further behind than anything else was hydrogen storage and new materials. People knew about compressed gas, but they were really interested in whether there were alternatives to this. And so this is where we got interested in, in, in the, um, as chemists in using hydrogen stored in chemicals to do low pressure uh, um, hydrogen storage. And so the big challenge here was weight, volume, and rates. There's just sort of three, but the many, many challenges. So this is an oversimplification, but it sort of gives you the gist of how we got started in this area. Um, what, uh, um, so for this alternate power for hydrogen storage, um, as, as we sort of in the U.S. are adjusting to uh, the new, new um, areas of research, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, has come up is, is really, uh, you know, other markets, other areas, stationary, storing it, be able to store hydrogen in stationary locations so that you can re use renewable energy. Uh, also, um, for uh, remote applications, uh, power lines, uh, um, uh, emergency powers, so if you have an ambulance and somebody who has a lot of medical equipment, can you, you can use, hydrogen provides a way to have much lower weight density and volume density so that you can use this as an alternative to uh, current technology with batteries. And so we've always had in mind this, this our eye towards these other applications as well. Um, this, this slide here I put together and actually was able to update it last week uh, at uh, the conference. It really, I thought, was intriguing to think about the economics of hydrogen storage. And when we first got started in this area back in 2004, when we looked at the, you know, what was being reported in the popular press about the hydrogen fuel cells in cars, um, it, w it wasn't very promising. They said that you know, cars, the, you know, if you wanted to buy a hydrogen fuel cell car, it would cost about $3 million to make it. Um, in, in, 19, uh, in, two, in 2003, and the range was about 170 miles. And then, uh, you know, in 2005, a couple of years later, it was really interesting to see that the price had dropped in half down to 1.5 million, still a lot more money than I make, and so I couldn't buy one of these. But it had dropped down and the mileage had gone up. And then two years later, 2007, the price dropped again to about a million um, when you read this, you know, in, 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 the, um, in the popular uh, magazines in the press. And in 2009, it dropped down by to 300,000, or about 10% of what it was uh, um, in 2003. So a significant drop, in, but still a lot of money. $300,000 is, is not something that uh, any of us can afford. And then just uh, this last week, I, I learned uh, um, from the workshop that I was at that uh, that Hyundai is going to try and release uh, a, a thousand fuel cell vehicles using compressed gas technology. And um, the estimated cost for these cars were now about 100,000. So still quite a bit, but a huge drop in less than 10 years from 1.5 million to 100,000. So um, if, if this is going to be used on vehicles, one of the things, this is sort of this infamous target table that uh, DOE had come up with. They went out, they went out and talked to the um, the U.S. auto manufacturers and said, oh, what would it take for you to be able to put fuel cells um, cars in the market? And, and, and so they've developed these targets that everybody sort of is, is trying to strive and find materials for. And the real, real driving um, range was to be able to get this 300 mile, uh, uh, b ability to drive 300 miles before having to refill your car. You know, one thing about batteries, the batteries is even though um, batteries can go 100, 200 miles, the recharge on a battery takes a long time. So if I wanted to drive to Seattle, which is 200 miles away, that could take me two days. And so that's not very practical. And so hydrogen cars, you can drive 300 miles, people are going to be more likely to buy that. So economics, no question, you have to have something that's going to compete on the same cost basis. But if you're going to develop a new technology, it has to be able to give you this 300 mile driving range. And to come, to get to that, they, they sort of estimated backwards that you would need to have ultimately about seven and you know a half uh, weight percent hydrogen. So pretty high material. Um, so this is for a system. So you would need much higher for for the whole um, system. I mean, it's for the system. So you need much higher than seven and a half for for the material. So um, when, when we saw all of this and we started thinking as chemists, you know, what, what could we do to make some contributions to this area? Um, ammonia, ammonium borohydride was at kind of at the top of our list. This is um, isoelectronic with methane. It's 24 weight percent hydrogen. Um, and, uh, and at the time, one of my theory colleagues had sort of challenged us as experimentalists. He said, 
look, I've done some calculations. Uh, people have been looking at borohydrides, and you know, but nobody's looked at putting hydrogen on the cation. And so, so Maciek Kutowski kind of got us into this area and said, you know, you're an experimentalist. You know, you you make compounds. Why don't you make this, and then we can, you know, save the world. And so, so what I did was, you know, I, I, this was back in 2004. I uh, didn't know a lot about hydrogen storage. I was still doing coal chemistry. Um, went to the library, looked up uh, the information on this and found out this compound wasn't stable. It would slowly decompose. But it would um, decompose to ammonia borane, uh, this compound right here. And so this compound is about 19 weight percent hydrogen. And what was really attractive was that this material was available for purchase from Aldrich Chemical Company. And so although we're not afraid to make things, if you can buy it commercially, then it must be relatively stable. And, it, and it, it gives you quite a bit of hydrogen. You can get 12, over 12 weight percent hydrogen from this material. And if you need a system that's 7.5 weight percent, then you need to have good engineering. You could pos possibly pull this off with using something like ammonia borane. Uh, eventually, if you had ammonium borohydride, that gives you a much more leeway. But there's a lot more challenges to uh, figuring out how this decomposes. So. Um, what, what, when you, again, through digging through the literature and reading about these compounds, it was fascinating that in the 1950s, um, the U.S. Department of Defense was funding a lot of research in, in using borane, uh, borane materials, uh, pentaborane and such, for uh, energy storage materials for jet fuels. And so there was, they were funding a lot of research in this area um, from applied to fundamental. And, um, for, for our point of view, that was really interesting was this work that came from uh, Richard Perry's lab um, at Michigan, where he was looking at ammonia borane and ammonium borohydride in this diaminate of diborane material. And so, so when we looked through the literature, there was all this inf interesting information um, before they had NMR spectroscopy and a lot of characterization techniques on what the properties of these materials were. And so I'll come back, and, and so what we got interested in is sort of the interplay between this, and I'll, I'll come back and address this. And so this was sort of our focus, but what we got started with was research from other chemists who had published this work and, and, uh, and then in the 50s, and then hardly anything else came out after that. Um, the, uh, um, and, and then it was in about 2000 that there was a group in Freiburg, Germany, uh, Gerrit Wolf, who had uh, come up with a, a, a thought of using this for a hydrogen storage materials, possibly on vehicles or other applications. But I really credit uh, um, Gerrit Wolf for doing this uh, original work in this area. And so we kind of learned from the research they did as well. And what they had published was that you could get, indeed get hydrogen from these materials, but it was exothermic and, and irreversible. And so they sort of lost interest in this, you know, because most people were interested in materials that were reversible, that you could use hydrogen pressure to put the hydrogen back on. And so it, it's a lot more challenging if you have to take the material off your car, fill it up at some other chemical processing plant, and then bring it back again. So, so ammonia borane has some interesting advantages, but there's some real disadvantages as well. So um, at, in, in, uh, at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, we became uh, uh, involved in uh, a couple of different research projects uh, um, from very uh, fundamental um, research, understanding hydritic and protonic hydrogen to more uh, um, uh, applied sort of research and how you get hydrogen off at fast rates. And we started looking at ammonia borane, and then we found that if we put it inside of scaffolds that this could um, enhance the properties, we could get hydrogen off faster, there were less impurities. Uh, then we um, started looking at the, um, this uh, ethylene diamine, uh, or, or this, uh, di uh, this diameter of diborane material, and in, in it's, uh, um, it's an isomer of uh, ammonia borane, and it turns out that there's some real interesting chemistry where these two are in equilibrium with each other. And so this became very important from a mechanistic study of the, the interplay between these materials. And then more recently, we started looking at ammonium borohydride because of the high hydrogen content and trying to understand why this is decomposing. Uh, and then uh, another compound that I want to tell you about is this ethylene diamine uh, bisborane. And, and this turns out to be one of my favorite ones, and I, I hope you'll understand why once I, I get through uh, um, the, the seminar here. The other thing we thought about at the time was, was how can we change and modify thermodynamics in these materials? We knew ammonia borane was exothermic and it was downhill. Metal hydrides are endothermic. Could you make some sort of composite material of uh, metal hydride and ammonia borane and, and modify the thermodynamics? And so we got involved 
through international collaborations uh, and, and looking at these metal amido borings with sodium and lithium and such. But what I want to talk to you today is the more recent work we've done with this ethylene diamine um, bisporane and ammonium borohydride and then these liquid materials. So um, what, one of the things that we, uh, over the course of this, pro this program of six years of research that I'm really proud of uh, in this group was that we, we, we um, the, the whole driving force was to do good research, publish in peer review journals. And so we published over 50 papers um, on, on, this, on these materials. Uh, and it was really trying to understand, again, the mechanistic chemistry of these to, to try and optimize uh, the storage properties. And, and it was really this protonic and hydritic hydrogen in these boron nitrogen complexes. And so what I'll, I'll do is, is um, uh, touch upon the more recent work that we've done. So um, the, the sort of the whole idea was can we control the stability of these materials? The ones that are not stable, can we stabilize them? The ones that are not are too stable, can we destabilize them? And, and look at these, uh, um, just start with these simple questions. As chemists, you know, we want to know what the mechanism of hydrogen release was. So it's when we dug through the literature, there was no information on how the hydrogen came off, just that it does come off. And then even what the structure of some of these materials, the ammonium borohydride, although it was made over 50 years ago, there was no structural information at all on this material, in, uh, in part because of stability issues. And so, you know, knowing how it decomposes, you have to work backwards and know what the structure of this material is. And so what we ended up finding through the course of our studies was that this is really fascinating interplay between these, these, uh, these, these structures here in, in how they release hydrogen. So, um, so why, why are BN compounds different? Why are we focused on these chemical hydrogen storage materials? We can store hydrogen at low pressure. Um, but it really comes down to sort of the, the, the negative charge around the, the, the BHs and the more positive um, hydrogens around the nitrogen. And so our, our, our intuition told us that if you have a material that has something that's slightly positively charged and something slightly negatively charged, they're going to be attracted to each other. And if they're attracted to each other, there might be a lower barrier for hydrogen release. And so materials like borohydrides and complex hydrides, uh, alanates, all decompose at higher temperatures, but they don't have this nice protonic and hydritic hydrogen. They either they have just um, hydritic hydrogen. So we thought this was the real reason why there was the lower temperature. But, um, but you know, again, trying to understand how you can stabilize or destabilize materials really um, required these mechanistic studies. We, we, we wanted to get... Um, a rate of zero at 60 degrees, so these compounds have to be stable at 60 degrees um, and not release any hydrogen. But then at 80 degrees, at a fuel cell, you want them to release hydrogen very fast. And so one of these uh, um, properties that you want to look for then is sort of a steep temperature dependence for hydrogen release from materials. It, you know, so if you have something that's zero at, at 60 degrees, but two grams of hydrogen per second at, at uh, um, at 80 degrees, that's a, a very steep temperature dependence. And so how do you go about doing that sort of thing? So that was a question in the back of our mind as well, is, is what, what leads to these sorts of things. And then the other thing was how do we improve the hydrogen um, purity of these materials? Because it's, uh, the other bad news is that these things, they start, they release other uh, volatile impurities that will poison a fuel cell. Even parts per million of ammonia is uh, um, a problem. So, um, kind of the pros and cons of, of this that, you know, it shows the good news and the bad news. Um, you know, we can release hydrogen at pretty moderate temperatures, you know, the temp temperatures, uh, you know, starting at 40 degrees uh, up to 160 degrees, we can get anywhere from, from, you know, 16 to 19 weight percent hydrogen. So much higher than, than the seven and a half system storage. And so we should be able to meet those system targets with these sorts of materials. Um, the, the materials, the other nice thing was they're, they're non-toxic and uh, stable. Um, most of them are stable to air and water. Uh, some of them have some impurities that are actually um, not stable in water, but the materials themselves in pure form are stable in water. And so that's also quite nice if you uh, are working with these materials. And if the public's going to work with materials like this, you'd like them to be non-toxic and, and stable in, in, uh, um, in regular atmosphere. And we also developed uh, some new synthesis of these materials. One of the downsides for these borane materials, they're often made from diborane. And, and so we came up with uh, new um, synthetic pathways to make these materials without having to go through diborane type materials. Um, the cons, the big, big um, elephant in the room 
is that they're irreversible, that they are exothermic, they're kinetically controlled. And so the good news is you can get fast rates from these if you need fast rates. The bad news is that the rate to put the hydrogen back on is slow enough. That means you have to take it off the car and go someplace else and do that. And so a chemist, that's not a problem. You can come up with ways to go and put the hydrogen back on. Um, but you have to be, you have to develop your infrastructure that will be able to handle that. Um, the hydrogen is not, um, is not five nines pure. It's, um, it's got parts per million of ammonia. And depending on the reaction conditions, you make a, this borazine, which is an inorganic uh, um, volatile compound that uh, is, uh, can be made uh, depending on how the reaction conditions are. And so this would be very detrimental to fuel cells. And so, again, understanding the mechanism of these things will help us to, to control the decomposition pathway. Uh, these materials are solid, so that it's very challenging to, to remove uh, the, them off a car and then put them back on again. And uh, one of the decisions that the engineering center has made in the U.S. is to look at ammonia borane, but to look at it in slurry form because they've, they've decided that moving solids off and on a car is not going to be practical. So they're looking, there's enough material, enough hydrogen that you could put this in some sort of slurry form that you could put it on and off a car. And the other thing that was a problem at the time was that these materials, as you, if you heat them up very fast, they're almost plastic-like. And, and they'll stretch, and you can get these bubbles and these foaming sorts of um, uh, interactions, which really decrease uh, um, the, the utility of these things if it's making this, this foam. And so we came up with some solutions to, uh, to mitigate and decrease the foaming. So, uh, so um, one of the, the approaches we, we took to, to really understand the mechanisms of, of hydrogen release from this is, is, is looking at... Uh, um, uh, in situ spectroscopy techniques. So by, by being able to monitor the evolution of the, we could look at the hydrogen gas come off by using mass spec or RGA or, um, or, and then other impurities by IR spectroscopy. But we wanted to kind of work backwards and understand what was left behind in these materials. And so uh, we, uh, solid state NMR spectroscopy turned out to be one of the best ways we could get some really useful insight into what was happening. Uh, we tried XRD spectroscopy, and it f was a, a failure for um, a, a lot of our early studies on ammonia borane and the metal amido borane. And so we had to turn to these things become amorphous as they lose hydrogen. Um, but XRD really kind of gave us some hints into this, uh, the stability of this ammonium borohydride complex uh, that we, we couldn't get from NMR. And then uh, also uh, we did, did a lot of volumetric studies because we want to see if we can get to rates of two grams of hydrogen per second and what temperatures it would require. So we do volumetric um, kinetic studies. And so I'm going to go into some research, uh, you know, what we've done recently with this ammonium borohydride and understanding the stability of that, uh, this uh, ethylene diamine bisborane, and, and finally these uh, liquid materials, these cyclic uh, um, uh, carbon boron nitrogen materials, which is a project that's actually just starting uh, for us this month. So um, as, as I mentioned, there was lots of research done in the, in the 50s on these materials. Uh, uh, you know, in Perry's group, they, they um, said that they could do this metathesis reaction. So you could take a, you know, an ammonium salt and a borohydride salt and, and mix these things in liquid ammonia and make the ammonium borohydride. But there was no char structural characterization. They said that within six hours that this compound had decomposed to some amorphous white solid and released hydrogen. And so not, that was all that was known when we first got started in this area. And so it was ripe for uh, really um, detailed mechanistic studies. And so not, not even information about the solid state structure of ammonium borohydride. Um, my, my theory colleague, uh, Maciek Gutowski, who got us started in this area, he, you know, he challenged us. He said, you know, when I do a theory calculation, it says this material is stable. Um, the literature must be wrong. You know, you, got, you chemists uh, you, you know, are, are just doing the wrong thing. And so it was this challenge for us to make, make these materials. And so you know, he said that, that you know, this should be zinc blend. And so it was kind of a, a simple enough challenge. Let's make this material. Let's characterize it. Let's see what it looks like. Um, and then um, just uh, recently, uh, there was a, a paper that came out from a group in Canada who were, was doing some structural characterizations of ammonium borohydride um, and, and the NRC uh, and, Canada, and Ottawa, Canada. And they said that this material, this ammonium borohydride, uh, was stable for months in their diamond anvil cell. So they took this compound, which we know decomposes in six hours at room temperature um, in, 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 at atmospheric pressure, and when they put it in a diamond anvil cell, they said that the material 
was stable. And so they kind of suggested that maybe it's reversible and if you're at high enough pressure, you can keep this thing compound in, in, its, uh, at pr in equilibrium pressure. But uh, we did some studies that sort of showed that actually we could calculate the pressure because of the reaction exothermicity, and I'll come to that later. You have to be around 10 to the ninth gigapascal to have an equilibrium pressure to have this. So, so this, this is really was this real curious observation that, that there was no explanation for, but the fact that you could stabilize it was really interesting because it's 24 weight percent hydrogen. In, um, in this uh, zinc blend uh, structure from these calculations, again, was what we needed to, um, to do some structural um, characterization. So we, we end up making this material. <clears throat> you can do these metathesis reactions. Uh, you remove the ammonia salt, and, and then you, know, if you don't have to, you know, six hours it decomposes. If you're quick with it, you can isolate it and stick it in a freezer at minus 80 degrees C, and then save it until you want to do any kind of studies. And, and this is even just a room temperature XRD um, spectra of this thing, so we can scan through this, you know, over the course of an hour and get good signal to noise. And it turned out that this compound was a, a, a rock salt structure and not zinc blend. And so there is when kind of the theory and experiment were, were still in agreement, and the, the, the theorists were telling us, well, if we could make zinc blend, it should be stable, and the rock salt's not stable. Um, but it was kind of made sense because when you looked at the size of the ammonium cation, it fits right in between the potassium and rubidium, which are these rock salt structures. And so we went back and, and revisited the theory, and what we found was that uh, these, these compounds uh, are, are very dynamic, that the ammonium group has got a, a large amount of entropy in this crystal, in this rock salt crystal structure, and it's tumbling uh, very rapidly. We did even neutron studies on these materials, and even down at... Uh, you know, at just a, a two Kelvin, we weren't able to freeze the motion of these things. So they're very dynamic, uh, and that's part of the st stabilizing ability of, of these materials to keep them uh, in the non-zinc blend sort of structure. But this, this reaction, we determined from by, then we could do um, TGA studies on this and, and NMR studies, and found that it was just too exothermic. And so, again, 10 to the ninth sort of pressures to stabilize this. So uh, how, how is how can we increase the stability of this thing if we don't, not all of us can, can pressurize these samples to, to half a gigapascal. So, so one of the things we thought about is as chemists, the ammonium borohydride has, uh, um, uh, the ammonium is, a, is, a, is an acid. It wants to give up a proton. The borohydride is, um, is not stable in the presence of acids. And so we have this solid state acid base reaction that leads to decomposition. And so then we can start to think, well, how can we slow down this reaction? How can we decrease the acidity of the ammonium cation? We can put methyl groups on there and change the acidity. Uh, but the other thing is we could dissolve this in a solution that forms hydrogen bonds with the ammonium cation. And so we, uh, had these, uh, we have these in-situ NMR capabilities, so we can do liquid phase um, uh, ammonia solution NMR at room temperature. So this is 100 PSI ammonia to keep it in a liquid state. And what we found was that uh, the ammonium borohydride was, was stable for, you know, a day um, in liquid ammonia. So it would have been gone just on the tabletop with no liquid ammonia around. And then we let this experiment go on for uh, a week, and it turned out to be stable for a week. So we found a way to stabilize the ammonium borohydride and another way to store it um, in using liquid ammonia. And, and it's very soluble. You can get... Um, uh, a, over 50 weight percent uh, ammonium borohydride dissolved in liquid ammonia. So it's, it's very, very, um, very soluble. So it's a nice way to store these materials. And then what we found out from kind of a, a related study was that if we add an um, a organic solvent, an organic ether like THF to the, to the compound, it would cleanly decompose to make a, ammonia borane. And so this gave this very nice clean way of making ammonia borane because the old way we were making it from the literature, there was all these impurities and you had to do these separations and purification steps. And so it turned out if we, could do, we can do this at large scale by starting with liquid ammonia and dumping in an ether solvent, we get a real nice clean conversion to make ammonia borane. So, so not only do we have a way to stabilize ammonia, ammonium borohydride, we have a way to make large quantities of ammonia borane. So this was a nice way to stabilize this, but it still didn't answer the question about the high pressure studies. And so we, we were trying to figure out what's, how, how to maybe test this. And um, we, when we look at the decomposition in the solid, it's different than it is in the liquid. And this was this XRD study where we could watch the rock salt structure of ammonium borohydride 
and it uh, would decompose and, and be replaced um, by uh, the uh, diaminate of diborane um, species here. So this decomposed, so two of these somehow in a solid state will, will do a solid state reaction and stay crystalline phase and make this diaminate of diborane. Um, in solution, it makes ammonia borane. And so it was a real puzzle. Well, what's, you know, how can you take all, all of these, uh, as chemists, again, we're, we, we we're always trying to think of how you move uh, electrons around and, and, and reorganize bonds. And so how can we get all this reorganization um, to, to do this? This is like it has to have an intermediate. We, we're, it's dying for an intermediate. But we don't see any evidence of any intermediate by XRD spectroscopy. And so what we, um, I think on the next slide, um, what, we, what we found was that uh, um, we proposed that ammonia borane, just like in solution, the ammonium borohydride decomposes to ammonia borane and hydrogen. But in the solid state, there's this very fast reaction because it's concentrated um, with the um, ammonium borohydride to make this diaminate of diborane. And so uh, as chemists, we like to push these electrons around. We can draw these structures of how, how this can happen. And, and then so to test this, um, what we, um, to test this hypothesis is that we took ammonium borohydride and ammonia borane and put it in a, a, a ball mill um, reaction vessel. And if you shake these together in a ball mill, a specs ball mill for five minutes, you, you make instantly uh, this diaminate of diborane. So where this takes, um, you know, hours at room temperature to decompose, we can make this reaction go very fast by mixing these two things together. If we do the control experiment where we just take ammonium borohydride and do a ball mill on that, um, five minutes, there's no change. 30 minutes, we start to see a little bit of the diameter of diborane. But it, if we have um, an equal amount of this, we get a nice clean way of making this diameter of diborane. So, so through doing these studies, we come up with kind of understanding of how these decompose and ways to actually make these materials. So now we know how to make the uh, pure form of ammonium borohydride. We can make pure forms of ammonia borane by doing solution, and we could do solid state uh, um, synthesis and make this diaminate of diborane. So, so we have three different um, hydrogen storage materials that we can look at and compare. But what was interesting about this sort of decomposition pathway is that if you're losing hydrogen and you're organizing all these bonds, what we thought was, well, if, if you have a positive volume of activation that and if you're compressing it, so in the transition state, if, you, if you, you have to expand, if you can compress on this, you might be able to slow down the reaction. So I know from solution phase, a lot of people have done solution phase studies under high pressure and show they can slow reactions down at higher pressures. Um, and so how can we test this in a solid state? And so we um, did, you know, was one of the difficulties with solid state decomposition, it's not as clean as the uh, solution phase. In liquid phase, you get simple first order reactions or second, second order reactions. In the solid state, uh, ammonium borohydride, uh, depending on the batch or the crystal size, would decompose in six hours plus or minus an hour. And if we wanted to look at subtle changes um, by looking at pressure effects, we couldn't do one experiment and then another experiment because the experimental error was too large. And so we conceived, uh, th um, Thomas Nielsen from Torben Jensen's group was visiting our laboratory. And um, one of the things we tried to do was um, these pressure effects and um, was to put ammonium borohydride inside of the mesoporous scaffolds. And so we were successful with ammonia borane in doing that. And we thought if we could put ammonium borohydride inside of a, a mesoporous silica scaffold, it would be enough clamping pressure that it could slow down the decomposition. Uh, unfortunately, when we put it in a scaffold, um, as soon as we isolated the material, it already decomposed. So the scaffold would, would um, catalyze the decomposition to make the diaminate of diborane species. And so that, di that wasn't successful. And, and so it was like, okay, can we, how can we do some other experiments? So we did these PCT experiments. And, and what we did was um, we could take the same sample and, and watch the decomposition at one pressure change the pressure, watch the decomposition, go back and forth. And so at five bar, um, we see uh, uh, this, press, this weight change, and then we increase it to 54 bar, and we get a slower rate. And then we go back to five bar, and the rate goes faster, and we go to, to 54 bar, and it gets slow again. So there's this subtle pressure effect that we, when we put um, hydrogen pressure over this, it's, it's starting to slow down. Now, we know it's not um, reversible, and so we we repeat this with using argon gas, something that should be completely inert, and we see something very similar that uh, you do, it, it is all you need is a physical pressure on clamping these things. 
and you can sl slow down the decomposition of this. So this isn't real slow. I mean, it isn't really, um, it, it it's changes the rate by five to 10%, but it's real enough to sort of um, implicate that uh, by using pressure, you can slow down reactions. So um, ammonium borohydride, uh, you know, it, it decomposes. It, we can get 19 weight percent hydrogen out of this material, uh, you know, heating it between 30 and 180 degrees. We can play these tricks where we can stabilize it. Uh, it decomposes, uh, you know, at ambient uh, temperature and pressure. Uh, but uh, again, high pressure uh, liquid ammonia will stabilize these materials. But, the, you know, it gives more hydrogen than ammonia borane, so we are happy about that. But it forms borazine. And so this borazine is is this volatile impurity that's going to affect your fuel cells. And so we're asking ourselves, okay, what, what can we do to modify these structures so that we can improve uh, the, the, uh, the properties of these things? So we want to minimize the borazine formation. So what, in, in these mechanistic studies, we have kind of discovered was that a lot of these um, volatile products were, were happening from ammonia borane when it was in the gas phase. And so if we could make ammonia borane less volatile, we should be able to increase the purity of uh, the hydrogen release. So we, this brings us to this uh, um, ethylene diamine bisporine complex. And um, what we can do is, is it, we don't want to increase the molecular weight too much, right? Because we have, we can get 16 weight percent hydrogen off of this thing. So we have a little bit of room to try and modify that. Uh, we, we did these metal amidoborane materials. And so this was really interesting to decrease the reacti decrease the exothermicity and also, we got no borazine from this. But what was really difficult was, from a chemist's point of view, of understanding how we might regenerate these materials. Ammonia borane, ammonium borohydride, we could regenerate those materials. But we were making these really complex materials here, and so it wasn't very satisfying for a, a full cycle sort of thing. So these metal mitoborines increased purity, but they also were only one shot. Um, there were groups that would put methyl groups on uh, the ammonia borane. Uh, but that just made it more volatile, and you got more impurities. And so we, we thought about, well, what would happen if we linked two ammonia boranes together with a methylene group? And um, you could buy uh, materials, starting materials, that you could make ammonia borane from these materials. And so there was this EDAB complex. Um, there's very little known about this. When we look, went and looked at the literature, there was one paper published in the 70s that said it decomposed under vacuum to give hydrogen. So that was promising. It gives hydrogen but nothing else was known about how stable this compound was or what other impurities. And so we set about doing some mechanistic studies to sort of answer these questions. Also, it was known methyl ammonia borane, uh, that's more exothermic. And so, you know, our, we don't want to go, we want to try and make these things closer to thermal neutral and not exothermic. So, so this sort of summarizes, uh, you know, uh, a lot of different, a lot of studies into this uh, ethylene diamine bisporane. It decomposes, so here's ammonia borane. It, this shows a, a, you know, a, 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 heat, a DSC where we see melting and a release of, of uh, a first step of hydrogen and then the second step of hydrogen. The EDAB was very similar. We get um, hydrogen off um, in two steps, just like we did for ammonia borane, and, uh, but no borazine. So this is ammonia borane, and, and we get this borazine peak, but there was no borazine that comes off this EDAB. So it looks a lot more pure. Uh, what was kind of interesting was that the decomposition temperature was a little bit higher. So the first step, uh, we know ammonia borane releases hydrogen at uh, you know just over 110 degrees. You have to heat EDAB up to 130 degrees to get the hydrogen off. What was surprising to us, and, and we, we we're not sure exactly why, but the actually turns out the reaction enthalpy was about half of what it was for ammonia borane. So this is good news if you have to worry about thermal management for these materials to have a, a, a less heat released as the hydrogen is released from these materials. The second step were, were pretty much the same uh, for the release of hydrogen. And, and we could get um, 10 weight percent hydrogen off of this EDAB material, which was, was not too bad. I mean, still 7.5 is your ultimate target, 10 percent um, where you have pure hydrogen is, is a good thing. And, and this wasn't the only surprise. Uh, one, one of the other things, when we started to do kinetics, isothermal kinetics, um, we, we saw that we knew that ammonia borane had this induction period. And so if you, you heat up ammonia borane to this is 100 degrees, and this is kind of the equivalence of hydrogen that come off as a function of time, that, um, that ammonia borane um, has an induction period and then um, and levels off, where EDAB um, just starts losing hydrogen in almost a, you know, a linear fashion with time like this. We could heat it up 
um, and look at, uh, and we were trying to get activation barriers for this. So 110 degrees, um, again, you see this induction period for ammonia borane, no induction period for, for the EDAB. And then this shows this kind of this at 130 degrees, it's actually EDAB becomes faster than ammonia borane. And so this, this comes back to this question we had at the very beginning of having this steep temperature dependence. And so we're finding some compounds that are stable at low temperatures but release hydrogen at faster rates at, at um, just at slightly higher temperatures. And so I think what, um, so this no induction period, less exothermic, um, if the compound's more stable at 60 degrees but more reactive at 130 degrees, lots of promising uh, um, things to this ethylene diamine bisporine compound. And so we were trying to understand why there's no induction period in this compound because the, you know, we knew for, ED, for uh, ammonia borane we could add in a trace of uh, um, the, uh, ethylene, uh, the, um, the DADB complex and get rid of the induction period. Uh, what we think is going on is since th we have two ammonia boranes linked together that they can actually uh, form this EDBA complex much lower temperatures and so we can get rid of this induction period. And so we use this solid state NMR to look at um, the different, again, the evolution of these materials as a function of time. The, you know, the, the starting material is real broad, but as you heat this up, you see this boral hydride, this BH4 peak grow in first. And so that was telling us that this came at much earlier times in that we probably have some sort of intramolecular reaction pathway that increases this, uh, decreases the induction period. So, so this graph sort of, I, I really like this one because this kind of is what I think is something that you, you strive for in find that, trying to find a good hydrogen storage material that it has this, this steep slope when you want to look at the, the rate of hydrogen release as a function of temperature. That y this is our ammon the ammonia borane complex uh, that we've been studying for five years. Uh, just over the last uh, year and a half, we were looking at this EDBA complex. And what's nice is that it's more stable at 60 degrees, which is critical for long-term storage, but um, less, uh, less stable at these higher temperatures. And again, trying to understand why this is, is um, you know, uh, can lead to um, other hydrogen storage materials. So understanding, again, the, from the mechanistic point of view is, is really um, critical to, to sort of improve upon what we've learned. So, so, this, so you know, lots of nice uh, um, uh, advantages over ammonia borane and ammonium borohydride. Uh, you know, it's got less hydrogen, but no borazine. So the hydrogen is very pure. We couldn't detect these impurities in our mass spectrometer. They may be there at lower concentrations below our detection limits, but much more pure than uh, uh, ammonia borane. But it still needs to be regenerated off board, and it and is still these solids. And, you know, you'd have to make a slurry of this compound if you're going to use it for a hydrogen storage material. And so this sort of brings me to kind of our next step in the evolution of our thinking about these uh, compounds is can we take these carbon compounds, so we have these carbons in here, and do something to make it a liquid. And if it's a liquid, can we um, keep it a liquid as it uh, um, loses hydrogen? So that's real critical that you don't have a phase change uh, from the starting material. So this is this this carbon boron nitrogen is, is the uh, liquid. And so that this is kind of, again, uh, uh, the, the evolution of our thinking of trying to, to keep improving on these materials. So this is a project that, that's just started um, this month. Uh, the, the funding just arrived, so we're, we're really excited about this. Uh, uh, University of Oregon and uh, Pro um, Professor Liu at University of Oregon is the pro um, project lead on this. He, he is uh, making these liquid uh, um, carriers, and so, um, the, the, the emphasis is trying to start with a liquid and end with a liquid so that you can pump off these materials off and on board. Again, this sort of recyclable gasoline. Uh, we, we also have a, as lower priority trying to look at high, high capacity materials like EDAB. I'd really like to understand that a little bit more, but that's a, a lower priority. And then one of the kind of stretch goals of this is, is can we couple endothermic and exothermic reactions to try and make the, the compound reversible? And so how would we do that? Um, and so I just have a few slides on this. Um, some preliminary results uh, from, from uh, Lou's group at University of Oregon. Th these are these cyclic uh, rings. So these are these car this carbon. It's the cyclopentane ring. It's got a methyl substituent on here. And it starts off as this nice liquid. And, and then uh, it's, it's l we've lost some hydrogen content. So we're sacrificing one, uh, one aspect to, to gain on another. 
but the nice thing is that it forms this very clean product. And so I was quite jealous uh, when we look at ammonia borane and ammonium borohydride and EDAB, it forms these really complex mixtures. And so it's much more difficult to do regeneration pathways. It's not impossible, but, but it's more challenging. So you have to do a couple extra steps to do regeneration. But you could use uh, cheap uh, catalysts, uh, you know, just starting with uh, throwing in some iron chloride into the compound. It would release uh, hydrogen at, at uh, you know, at 80 degrees uh, and, and quantitatively make this nice complex here. And, and he, so he's a, he's a fantastic uh, um, synthetic chemist and so he, j he hasn't optimized this, but it's, he can do this in a very few, number of s very few number of steps. And so that's important if you're gonna make something like this as a, a liquid hydrogen carrier. So you can get this in 50% yield, but uh, I, I believe he can do uh, uh, with some optimization, get much higher than this. Um, this, this kind of shows uh, a, a real nice uh, graphic of th this is what happened. The iron chloride gets converted into this black amorphous material. So some sort of magnetic species that's probably the true catalyst. And so trying to figure out what that is is really interesting as well. Um, but it's, this is a stir bar. So this is a magnetic stir bar. So all the particles stick to this. But you can see the hydrogen bubbles off of this and, um, and form this hydrogen. So it stays a liquid throughout the whole, s all the whole process. Um, and then uh, they, they've uh, gone in and showed uh, they can uh, regenerate this in two steps. Uh, so they can dissolve the product material here in methanol and make this methyl borate compound. And so this is at room temperature, very low energy. Uh, you just dissolve this in methanol and then isolate this compound. And then he adds uh, lithium aluminum hydride and he can get reduction to the starting material. So he can get um, you know, 90, over 90% 90 yield, which is, um, uh, is, is great for just the initial studies, and, and so this can be optimized. Uh, but what we really want to do, the focus is on trying to figure out a, a, something else besides the, the aluminum hydride for this, because we, get, we have to regenerate the aluminum hydride, and so we, and for a regeneration process, we'd like to make this catalytic. And so that's also, it's not a focus of this project, but it's something that needs to be developed. Uh, the focus of this project is to sort of look at these um, potential of these liquids and the purity of these materials. So, as I said, this this project is just starting out. Um, you know, here here's the, the the you know the compound we're looking at now. We, we're going to put methyl groups in different locations uh, to see how that changes the properties, changes the rates of these materials. Uh, they're they're liquids. Um, what uh, then we're going to look at uh, some potentially reversible systems. Uh, and there here's this EDAB complex. And, and one of the things I'm real interested in is using um, these, these solvents as, uh, uh, that carry hydrogen as a way to dissolve uh, EDAB. And so if it's only 4.7 weight percent hydrogen as the liquid, can we dissolve these other compounds in here and boost up the hydrogen content? And so I'm very excited about um, the potential of using these solvents for in, in, um, doing uh, liquid sort of carriers for, for hydrogen storage. So, um, so it's to sort of summarize, um, you know, we, we're looking at uh, these liquid phase reactants. We can get five, almost five weight percent hydrogen at temperatures below 100 degrees. Um, increased hydrogen purity, uh, regeneration is simplified, uh, but the reaction is still exothermic. And so th there's thermal um, management issues and you need to think about ways to maybe tune the thermodynamics. And so just over the last couple of slides, what I'd like to show you is, is sort of this new direction of what we're trying to think about, how to tune the thermodynamics in these materials. So we, we went from, from materials like ammonia bor ammonium borohydride, which it wasn't stable and stabilizing it, to EDAB, which gives us more pure, which is more stable, to these liquid compounds. Sort of the next step in evolution, I think, is trying to figure out a way to, to tune the thermodynamics of these materials. And so um, what kind of came about was in all our studies of ammonium borohydride, we knew that this decomposed uh, um, one way to give ammonia borane and that we could stabilize this under high pressure, but we could never make it go bad. Um, but, you know, as we were doing our hydrogen storage research, we were following the literature and, and found this, this really interesting paper um, published from Doug Stefan's group that said that he took a, a compound that had a borane uh, like this and a phosphine, which is um, another Lewis uh, base like this, and that he could add hydrogen back and forth across this thing reversibly. And so why is this compound reversible and this one not reversible? And so that's really piqued our interest. And you know, this is a phosphorus, this is a nitrogen, but 
that it turns out that uh, subsequent to this, there were a, a number of studies where people showed that they could use either phosphine bases or these amine bases and still see reversible hydrogen storage. So some of these compounds actually um, wanted to absorb hydrogen and not give it up. And then some compounds um, would, uh, would not take up hydrogen. And so uh, it was a question of, well, what's going on with this? And so there was, uh, um, th so these are uh, kind of showed some typical Lewis acids that l are like our borohydride and these uh, Lewis bases, which are like our ammonium cation. Uh, you can do this in bimolecular systems or in uh, intramolecular systems. So in, in, admittedly, in these cases, the hydrogen content is very low, but the fact that you can do this reversibly is interesting. And, and so what can we learn from this? And so um, what kind of came out from this was uh, a, a group in um, Budapest had suggested, well, let's think about this as a thermal chemical cycle. So what, what, how much energy does it take to break hydrogen apart into an H plus and an H minus? Um, and then if you have this data of adduct like we get from ammonia borane, you break it into the sum of the parts. And so we get uh, this, all this uh, preparation energy. And then you can start to stabilize these compounds. You can take the hydride and attach it to the Lewis acid, take the proton, attach it to the Lewis base. You make an ion pair and you bring them together again. And I think this, this next um, figure here, oh, this, this is, uh, um, shows uh, sort of, uh, um, there's 29 different compounds where they'd use this thermal chemical cycle to predict whether or not this would work. And so those, these are composed of those structures I showed you on those, that slide before. And when the stabilization energy is, it gives you delta G negative, it would, the reaction was observed to split hydrogen and, and absorb hydrogen. When the uh, activation was uh, not so stabilizing, you would get these red lines and they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't happen. You, you couldn't get hydrogen absorption. There were some, some strange anomalies like this complex here, this T-butylphosphine, uh, that seemed to absorb, hydro absorb hydrogen but was predicted not to. There's another compound that was predicted to uh, um, be really exothermic, but it released hydrogen uh, reversibly. And so, so it was a nice qualitative way, but uh, um, what we're interested in is trying to quantify this in, in our future studies. So this, this sort of shows graphically um, what I, I mentioned before. So what you do is you take your, your Lewis acid base like ammonia borane and hydrogen, and you split it into um, the uh, acceptor, the donor, and these protons. So this is the energy going in, and this is the energy to stabilize it. And if this is negative, you can make hydrogen go this way. If it's positive, the hydrogen goes this way. And, and so this, this is, um, you know, what we were able to do is put together uh, uh, for ammonia borane, um, the, you know, we could, we could calculate uh, what the, uh, um, we knew what the gas phase uh, bond association energy was for this to break it into ammonia and the borane. Uh, we knew, uh, uh, we worked with uh, um, Rich Behrens at Sandia to measure the heat of vaporization of this to put it into the gas phase. You use this, this value here, this is in kcal's uh, uh, enthalpy for the bond strength of hydrogen in the gas phase. And then you can go look up, well, what happens when I add the hydride to this borane? the proton to the ammonia, and then stabilize the anion. And it turns out to be about 20.8 kcals uphill to do the hydrogen. So this is kind of where we get um, the pressure. You, there's no way you could pressurize um, uh, ammonia borane with hydrogen to make this ammonium borohydride if it's uphill by 21 kcals per mole. Um, so this, so this is the same, uh, um, uh, shows all those values, and, and we added up to get the 20 kcals per mole, and, and um, but so, so what we started to think th um, the last couple of slides here was that we, we were hoping that, okay, if we can stabilize um, either the hydride or the proton by tuning the, um, the st stabilizing power of the Lewis acid or the Lewis base, we would be able to maybe make something that had less, um, uh, uh, it wasn't quite as heavy as these other compounds to uh, to make a reversible hydrogen storage material. And so we, we, um, we, we could go through and then look at ammonia, and this is our base um, case um, uh, study, which was uphill by 20.6 kcals per mole. Um, and then we put a methyl group on there, and, and we, um, what we found was that uh, it, while the, the, uh, P, the proton affinity, the stabilizing power, goes up by 10 kcals per mole, and then we put three methyl groups on there. It goes by 20 kcals per mole. So when we first put this table together, we were real excited because we only needed about 20 kcals to get us to a stabilizing uh, uh, species. Um, but the problem was 
is that um, as you make these bigger ions, you get less um, stabilizing of the, the ion pair. And so in the solid state, these things aren't so reactive. And what we're interested in now is if you do these in liquid phase, can you get more, um, more stabilized uh, ion pairs in, in, in solution for these, these uh, larger uh, amine groups? So um, I think this is what my last, more or less my last slide. What, what I wanted to do was sort of show you kind of these connections to wh where, we, where we were at um, at the beginning with ammonia borane. We could take this nitrogen complex in this borane complex. And, um, and then when we added, had hydrogen across it, we'd have the ammonium borohydride. And so we knew that this would lose hydrogen and make ammonia borane. But now there are these complexes where we can tune the reactivity and change the thermodynamics um, by, uh, uh, and using them in a catalytic cycle. And so when these groups, when, one of the things that kind of came out from these studies was that if you can prevent the dative bond from forming between the Lewis acid and Lewis base, you would be able to create this, this very reactive pocket. And so that hydrogen will diffuse inside of here and get split um, into a H plus and an H minus. And so if th that's a, a nice, if you can do this in a cycle, you have a hydrogen storage material. But it might not be uh, sufficient, it won't be sufficient for onboard storage. It might be sufficient for some sort of stationary storage type of process. But there are other applications that we're interested in, in specifically catalysis. And can we use these things to do um, catalytic reduction of uh, and storing energy in, in hydrogen in these sorts of bonds and that you could take CO2 and make methanol or take biomass features and make uh, uh, upgraded biomass. And so we're real interested in, in the catalytic nature of these materials. And so one project we have going on now is looking at these as catalyst materials, while the other project we're, we're, we're looking at these liquid-based materials. So um, sort of to kind of wrap, wrap up this, 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 uh, this presentation, um, we really, um, you know, that the kind of was this, this evolution, the stepwise uh, process to trying to understand and improve these materials. Um, wh one of the things about these uh, BN uh, um, carbon nitrogen boron compounds is that uh, you, you need to control decomposition because of their exothermicity. So you can tune, tune that a little bit with putting methyl groups on there. Um, and, and we could find scaffolds and this EDAB and this methyl amidoborines as a way to improve the uh, reaction purity as well as decrease exothermicity. Um, and, and there's a lot of really nice work out there looking at ammonia borane and different materials. And sometimes I'm a little bit disheartened that um, people are adding different things to ammonia borane to make it more reactive. And the, the problem is, is it's, it's almost, it's too reactive. And you need to find a way to, to change the slope of that reaction curve so that, that, it, that at 60 degrees, it's very stable and then, you know, at, at temperatures, you know, not much above 80, it's, it's unstable. So that's the sort of work that's really necessary, I think, for these sort of compounds in the solid state for them to be useful is to understand how, how to make them more stable at 60 degrees and less stable at, uh, so, so people have done nice work to show that they can destabilize it, but how can you tune that so you can have the, the both, both of those things? And then the, the thermodynamics, this is a, an area that I'm real interested in now, is being able to tune these. These things before, when we got started in this area, were considered never to be reversible. There's no way you could reverse these things. But we're, you know, by, by doing some of these studies, we think that uh, we're getting insight into how we might be able to make these things eventually um, reversible. And, um, and so um, I'd just like to acknowledge um, research we have on the liquid Carriers is from the, uh, will be from Office of Fuel Cell Technology at EERE, uh, and, and I'm excited about that. That's a new project. Um, our solids materials are, 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 is that project's over, and we're moving on into liquids. And um, with the uh, fundamental studies, we're, we're interested in looking at these materials as catalysts and other applications beyond hydrogen storage. And then uh, um, my research group, one of the nice things about working at a national laboratory is uh, you can find someone who knows something about everything. Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, there's 4,000 uh, employees there, about 2,000 scientists, and uh, they really has been, uh, um, uh, I, there's no way only one person could do this. It, it really took a, a large group to, to make the progress we made, and, and thank you for your uh, attention. <laughs>